Hello, I'm Eric Huang, and you're listening to Saint Podcast, a podcast about the always fascinating and often controversial lives of the saints. Saint Podcast is a history and culture podcast that traces the origins of the morality tales of the saints, or hagiographies, and how they continue to impact our lives today. This debut series of Saint Podcast is dedicated to martyrs, saints who died as a result of their beliefs. Over the next ten episodes, we'll hear about martyred saints ranging from a queen who bested the brightest minds of the Roman Empire, a saint who was swallowed alive by a dragon, twin brothers who were both doctors, a gay icon, and many more. There are several saints named Margaret. Episode three of Saint Podcast series about martyrs is about the most well-known, Margaret of Antioch. She's the patron saint of childbirth and pregnancy, kidney disease, nurses, the falsely accused, exiles, peasants, and Malta. She's also known as Margaret the Virgin Martyr, and Margaret the Vanquisher of Dragons. Margaret was born around the year 289 in the Roman city of Antioch in Pisidia, the ruins of which are found in the Turkish lakes region today. Her mother died in childbirth, and Margaret's father, Idasius, a pagan priest, engaged a nursemaid named Theotimus to bring up his baby daughter in the countryside a few miles outside the city. Unbeknownst to Idasius, Theotimus was a committed Christian. Away from the watchful eyes of her employer, the nursemaid raised Margaret in the Christian faith. Margaret grew into an attractive young woman. She was also very devout and promised herself at a young age to the Christian God. When Margaret's father discovered this, he fired the nursemaid and disowned his daughter. And so Theotimus and Margaret led a simple peasant life together in the countryside, tending sheep. The shepherd is a very ancient symbol. Greek and Roman legends abound with shepherds. There's Endymion, whose handsome face so captivated the goddess of the moon, Selene, that she enchanted him into eternal sleep so she could forever gaze upon him whilst traveling the night sky. A handsome shepherd named Ganymede was desired by Zeus, who transformed into a giant eagle to kidnap him. Ganymede was taken to Mount Olympus, the home of the gods, where he was granted immortality and became Zeus's personal cupbearer. Paris, the man who started the Trojan War by declaring the goddess Aphrodite more attractive than Hera or Athena, was also a shepherd. Another shepherd is Fastulus, the man who rescued Romulus and Remus, the legendary twins who founded the city of Rome. In antiquity, Choreophorus, or the ram bearer, was one of many shepherd figures worshipped by cults throughout the Mediterranean and Mesopotamia. Livestock was so important that the shepherd became a godlike figure a nature spirit full of raw, primal power. It was the Greeks and Romans that imbued the shepherd with innocence and purity. Shepherds were linked to nature. They spent time in the bucolic countryside with their flock, not sullied by city life and all the temptations therein. Like their contemporaries, Christians also embraced the shepherd symbol. Jesus himself is referred to in the Bible as a shepherd of souls, the good shepherd. The faithful are his flock. John the Baptist, a maternal cousin of Jesus, is a saint often depicted as a shepherd boy. Here is the passage in the Bible, John 1.29, where John the Baptist refers to Jesus as the Agnes Day, or the Lamb of God. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb is significant because it's innocent, a young sheep, also a sacrificial animal a gift given by the faithful to gods of every religion. It's in the Christian era that the shepherd symbol becomes more commonly female. The connection to innocence in the Greek and Roman traditions now took on a literal meaning of virginity in the shepherdess. So saints like Margaret became associated with this symbol to emphasize their purity and virginity. Other saints, like Agnes and Rose, are depicted cradling lambs in their arms. This represents not only their own purity, but their closeness with Jesus, the Lamb of God. All of the saints linked with lambs are martyrs. Like these animals, their lives will be sacrificed for the glory of God. Margaret's story isn't in the Bible. 
The first surviving mention is the 9th century martyrology by Rabanus Maurus, a Benedictine monk who compiled stories of martyrs. Margaret's story is then fleshed out in the now familiar 13th century golden legend. According to these sources, the beautiful shepherdess Margaret came to the attention of a man named Olybius while she was tending her flock one day. Olybius was the governor of the Diocese of the East, a Roman province between the Mediterranean and Mesopotamia. Overcome by desire, the governor instructed his men to kidnap Margaret and bring her to him. If she turned out to be a free woman of reasonable social standing, he'd marry her. If she were lowborn, or a slave, he'd make her its concubine. This is a similar story to so many shepherd tales in Greek and Roman legends, except that a young man is lusted after and kidnapped instead of a young woman. So Margaret rejected Olybius' advances, of course. She declared to all present that she had already devoted her body and soul to the Christian God. Olybius insisted Margaret renounce her illegal religion and accept him as her protector. She refused. Rebuffed and humiliated, Olybius had Margaret imprisoned on charges of being a Christian. Margaret's story matches the legends and fates of so many virgin female saints from Catherine to Agatha, Cecilia, Agnes, and so on. All were as beautiful as they were pious. They were nearly always upper class, then sent away and adopted by a kind but impoverished person, inevitably attracting the unwanted advances of a pagan official. It's a common ancient and medieval trope, the same basis for fairy tales like Snow White, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, virginal orphans sent away to live in the wilderness in conditions far below their station, waiting to be saved by marrying a man. The ancient roots of these stories from China and Persia and ancient Greece were often reflections on the low position women had in society, no matter their class. Their only salvation was the hope of marrying up. Whereas virginal fairy tale princesses live happily ever after on earth, saved by a prince, virginal saints find eternal happiness in death in heaven, saved by God. Margaret was now in prison, guilty of being a Christian. Olybius returned the next day, confident she'd be ready to accede to his every desire. When he begged her once again to renounce her faith and worship the Roman gods, Margaret again refused and rebuked him. I adore the god before whom the earth trembles, the sea storms, and all creatures are fearful. Furious, Olybius ordered Margaret to be hung up on a rack. The golden legend describes in gory detail the fate that befell her. She was beaten with rods and then lacerated with iron rakes, so cruelly that her bones were laid bare, and the blood poured from her body as from a pure spring. Onlookers wept for poor Margaret and beseeched her to renounce her illegal faith to save her life. She remained steadfast. Margaret's bloodied body was taken back to her cell. That night, a divine light shone around her, healing her wounds. But something wasn't quite right. Margaret felt a presence. Convinced that a malicious force was working against her, she prayed to God to make this enemy visible. At her side appeared a dragon. Dragons have a long history in religion and legend. Their roots can be traced to snakes. To ancient peoples, snakes were mystical creatures that bridged the world of the living and the dead, existing both in darkness and in light. They were thought of as chthonic animals because they dwelt underground in darkness and yet emerged daily to bask in the full light of the sun. Snakes shed their skin, which cultures worldwide from the Hopi in North America to the Khmer in Cambodia linked to fertility, immortality, even existence itself. It's a snake called Jormungandr in the Norse religion of the Vikings that encircles the earth with its tail in its mouth. Ragnarok, the end of the world, begins when the serpent releases its tail. Jormungandr, a snake biting its own tail, is a common image across the ancient world. It's called an Ouroboros, a symbol of infinity. Snakes were also thought to be among the most wise of creatures. Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent god of the Aztecs, was lord of the wind and rain. He was also the bringer of knowledge and the inventor of books. 
Snakes the world over have guarded hidden knowledge and deep magic in a tree. Ladin, the serpent in the garden of the Hesperides, watched over the golden apples that Hercules took in one of his labors. Mukalinda protected the Buddha under the Bodhi tree. The vision serpent coiled around the tree of life in legends from the Maya. This wisdom combined with their chthonic nature made snakes symbols and deities of medicine and healing. The venom that many possess is a deadly poison that can also be used to treat a variety of ailments, even as an antidote to the poison itself. This alchemy implied a mastery of arcane knowledge to cure and to kill. A staff with a snake entwined around it, the rod of Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine, is a modern international symbol for healthcare. In China, snakes grew legs to become dragons, benign water spirits who contained all the wisdom of the ages. East Asian dragons have tiny legs on snake-like bodies, resembling the curving rivers they embody. They're revered as supernatural beings of goodness, good luck, and fortune. In the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the legend of Adam and Eve tells of a snake who, like the wise and life-giving snakes that came before him, guards a tree, the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. But this story turns the tables. This snake is evil, the devil in disguise. In the Garden of Eden legend, knowledge isn't a gift, but a curse. Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, live in paradise, in harmony with nature. Everything in the Garden of Eden is at their disposal, except for the fruits on the tree of knowledge. These were originally pomegranates, but are now universally referred to as apples. The devil, disguised as a snake, tricks the couple into taking bites from the forbidden fruit. Once they do so, they are no longer like the animals around them. No longer do they live an ignorant life of bliss. They now have knowledge, and with knowledge comes responsibility. Adam and Eve are suddenly aware of their nakedness. They feel shame and hunger for the first time, also anger. They're now human and are forced to leave the blissful ignorance of paradise. As Christianity continued to spread in the medieval era, this same snake, the devil in disguise, grew legs like its Asian counterparts. Illuminated manuscripts and paintings show how its sinuous body shortened and grew larger over time until it became what we now recognize as a dragon, a big hulking dinosaur with wings. Dragons and snakes were no longer guardians of wisdom and knowledge. They were symbols of pure evil. It wouldn't be until the 20th century that humans admire these creatures again, imagining dragons as companions and friends, from Puff the Magic Dragon to Pete's Dragon, How to Train Your Dragon, and the Dragon Riders from Game of Thrones. It's an evil medieval dragon, the devil in disguise, that faces Margaret in her cell. There are two versions of what happened next. The most popular and most widely depicted in art is that the dragon opened its mouth and swallowed Margaret whole. While she sat in the monster's stomach, she made the sign of the cross, or alternately she prayed whilst holding a crucifix. The power of God released her and she exploded out of the dragon, vanquishing the devil. It's this detail of Margaret's legend, the encounter with the dragon, that made Pope Gelasius declare Margaret apocryphal in the year 494. This means that whilst the legend of St. Margaret is a popular story, widely circulated and believed by many to be true, it isn't. According to Pope Gelasius, the legend of St. Margaret was fake news. In 1969, her Roman Catholic feast day of July the 20th was removed from the general Roman calendar the Catholic Church's official schedule of holy days. The dragon episode is also what makes St. Margaret the patron saint of childbirth and pregnancy. Paintings and sculptures often depict the moment when Margaret bursts out of the dragon's body, looking like a baby emerging from the womb, but also a bit like a centaur with a woman's torso and the body of a giant lizard. Margaret's patronage over kidneys and kidney disease is linked to the belt she wears in medieval art. It's called a demisciant, a thin 13th to 14th century belt that ends in two round fittings joined by a hook and chain. The belt hangs loosely around the waist and hips. Kira Knightley wears one in the 2004 King Arthur film, 
and every Maid Marian in every Robin Hood movie wears one too. Head to St. Podcast's social media pages to see for yourself. Because the belt is worn near the kidneys, St. Margaret is recognized today as the protector of nephrology, the medical speciality that studies and treats the kidneys. An alternate version of what happened in Margaret's cell that night is told by the Orthodox Church. Instead of a dragon, the devil himself appears to Margaret, not in disguise, but in his infernal form as a demon. He taunts her and tests her faith. He doesn't succeed. Margaret ends up beating him to submission with a hammer given to her by an angel. Whether she defeats the devil by bursting out of him or beating him with a hammer, Margaret's ordeal isn't over. In the Golden Legend, the devil returns as a man who attempts to trick Margaret into accepting his help. Margaret isn't fooled in the slightest and pushes him to the ground by his head, saying, Lie still at last, proud demon, under the foot of a woman. The devil knows he's been beaten and laments his humiliation. He could accept an honorable defeat from a man but being bested by a mere girl is something he just can't bear. The devil also reveals that he was friends with Margaret's pagan parents. They were all in league against her since the day she was born. The pair then have a conversation about why the devil wastes his time persecuting the virtuous. It's mainly jealousy, he confesses. Like Adam and Eve, who were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, the devil was also cast out of paradise. He was kicked out of heaven after staging an unsuccessful coup against God. Whatever transpired in the cell that evening, Olybius returns in the morning to ask Margaret for the third and final time to accept his hand in marriage. Of course, she refuses. So Olybius drags Margaret out into the square to be burnt at the stake. The flames leave her uninjured. Next, the governor has Margaret thrown into a cauldron of boiling water. Sometimes it's molten lead. Again, she emerges unscathed. This second miracle is enough to cause the crowd of onlookers to convert to Christianity. All were beheaded, the 5,000 onlookers and Margaret herself. Other versions of the story name the Roman emperor Diocletian as Margaret's killer. Diocletian ruled the Eastern Roman Empire at this time. He's the same Diocletian that had St. Sebastian shot with arrows then clubbed to death as part of the Great Persecution. Margaret is sometimes counted among the victims as well. Despite Pope Gelasius' decree that Margaret was apocryphal, her cult continued in the East. After all, there was no dragon in the Eastern Orthodox legend. It was a solid morality tale about a virtuous girl's battle against the devil. The Eastern Orthodox Church had broken away from the Roman Catholic Church in the year 1054. The East-West Schism, or the Great Schism, was the culmination of centuries of deepening divisions between two political power centers, one in Rome, the other in Constantinople. The division centered around theological disputes, ranging from the nature of the Holy Spirit to the type of bread that should be used during the Eucharistic rite. Even before the Great Schism, St. Margaret's worship in the Eastern Orthodox Church continued unabated, and it flourished once the two churches split. When the Crusades began in the 11th century, soldiers from the West traveled east to liberate the Holy Land from Islamic rule. This lasted for over 200 years. Making a pilgrimage to the East and to the Holy Land became fashionable for those who were brave enough and wealthy enough to endure the arduous and dangerous trip. As pilgrims returned to Western Europe from their Eastern travels, the worship of St. Margaret was revived in the form of souvenirs brought home from faraway lands. This is why St. Margaret is still so popular in Western Europe and in countries that were once its colonial possessions. There are over 230 churches dedicated to Margaret in England alone, including the 12th century church adjacent to Westminster Abbey in London. In the Orthodox Church, St. Margaret is called St. Marina. The name is Latin. It means ocean, derived from the same root word as marine, maritime, marinara sauce, and mermaid. The Greek equivalent for marina is Pelagia, which means of the sea. Saint Pelagia is another one of Saint Margaret and Saint Marina's many names, used especially in Greece. 
The word Margaret itself is also linked to the ocean. It's an ancient Indo-European word that means pearl in languages from Persian to Sanskrit to Latin. The close association between the saint and the sea, with Margaret meaning pearl and Marina and Pelagia both meaning the ocean, links the figure of St. Margaret to an even more ancient goddess, Aphrodite. Before the Romans turned her into Venus and a god of love, Aphrodite was a god of the sea. Aphros means foam in Greek and refers to her birth in the foam of the sea. She's often depicted floating on a scallop shell, the source of the most valuable pearls. In her guise as goddess of the sea, Aphrodite was also known to ancient Greeks by another name, Pelagia. St. Margaret, St. Marina's legend is arguably an appropriation of the Greek goddess into a Christian saint. As Christianity spread through Europe and the Near East, replacing indigenous religions, local shrines and sacred landmarks were adapted into Christian places of worship, renamed after saints resembling the original gods. The legends of St. Margaret, St. Marina, and St. Pelagia overlap and conflate each other. Academics are in general agreement that they're all the same person, although many also consider St. Margaret and St. Marina to be two separate people. The St. Marina separate from St. Margaret is sometimes called St. Marina the Monk. St. Marina the Monk's story is fascinating. It's about cross-dressing. Promised to a young noble as a wife, Marina, who like Margaret, devoted herself to the Christian God at an early age, runs away from the arranged marriage. She finds refuge in a monastery, disguised as a man, a monk named Marinos. Due to hard work and diligence, Marinos ends up running the monastery and the adjacent convent. Ever out to get her, the devil tricks a nun from the convent into getting pregnant by a local. Everyone blames Brother Marinos, the only man who has access to the nun. Marinos doesn't plead his innocence and is sentenced to solitary confinement in a cave where he's fed only enough bread to keep him alive. It's after he dies that the brothers realize Marinos is Marina, a woman who could not have possibly impregnated the nun. Other versions of this story refer to St. Marina by her other name, St. Pelagia, whose alter ego is Pelagius. The legend also varies in the details of why Marina Pelagia enters the monastery. The most popular alternate version describes Marina as the daughter of wealthy Christian parents. As in Margaret's story, her mother dies when Marina is very young. Her father, Eugenius, raises her as a devout Christian. When Marina is old enough to get married, he arranges a suitable husband for her and decides to retire to the monastery of Canovine in modern-day Lebanon. Marina is distraught and asks her father if it's fair to save his own soul while destroying hers. Understanding that his daughter wishes to remain a virgin for God, he calls off the marriage. Marina shaves her head, disguises herself as a man, and both enter the monastery. Father and daughter share a cell and live a simple life of prayer for ten years, when Eugenius dies. Marina mourns her father's death, but continues to live in the monastery as Marinos. Her fellow brothers have always noticed how feminine Marinos looks and sounds, but chalk it up to a life dedicated to constant prayer and asceticism. Others assume Marinos is a male eunuch. One day, the abbot in charge of the monastery sends Marinos and two other monks to town on church business. The work takes all day and they have to spend the night at an inn before returning to the monastery in the morning. There they meet a Roman soldier who's been fighting Persians on the Eastern Front. They strike up a conversation, then bid good night to the soldier and retire to bed. The soldier isn't tired, though. He notices the innkeeper's incredibly beautiful daughter and seduces her, taking her virginity. When he leaves, he tells her his name is Marinos, promising to return. He doesn't. The soldier ghosts the innkeeper's daughter, and when she discovers she's pregnant, she tearfully confesses to her father that she sinfully spent the night with a man named Marinos. The innkeeper remembers Brother Marinos and confronts the abbot, who demands Marinos explain himself. Marinos is overcome with emotion and weeps, not because he defiled the innkeeper's daughter, but because his life as a monk, as a man, is a deception. Marinos makes no attempt to defend himself and begs for forgiveness. The abbot understands this as an admission of guilt 
and throws Marinus into the street. Having nowhere to go, Marinus lives as a beggar outside the monastery gates. When the innkeeper's daughter gives birth, Marinus is given the baby to raise as his own, feeding it with sheep's milk provided by local shepherds. When the child turns 10, Marinus is finally allowed back into the monastery. All is forgiven, but Marinus is tasked with the most difficult jobs at the monastery, cooking, cleaning, carrying water to atone for his sins, all whilst caring for and raising the innkeeper's daughter's child. At the age of 40, Marinos falls ill and dies after three days of fever. As the monks prepare the body for burial, they discover at last his true identity. Marinos was a woman and couldn't possibly have violated the innkeeper's daughter. A grand funeral is planned for Marina with all in attendance, including the innkeeper and his daughter. It's said that one of the monks who was blind regained his sight when he touched Marina's corpse. Other legends tell of demons unleashed by God to torment the innkeeper and his daughter, and also the soldier, for their unkindness to poor St. Marina. St. Margaret is one of the 14 holy helpers. 14 saints grouped together in the 14th century who were invoked in defense against disease, in particular the Black Plague. The grouping originated from western Germany near the Rhine. It was called the Nothelfer, German for emergency helpers. Many legends surround this Avengers-like grouping of saints who all look after a specific disease, ailment, or part of the body. Here they are in alphabetical order. Agathias, Barbara, Blaise, Catherine of Alexandria, Christopher, Syriacus, Denis, Erasmus, Eustace, George, Giles, Margaret, Pantaleon, and Vitus. Other saints, including St. Sebastian, whom we met in the last St. Podcast episode, are sometimes included or substituted for the Core 14. St. Margaret, along with two other virgin saints, Barbara and Catherine, are the founding group. A story involving St. Margaret and the other 13 holy helpers revolves around the site of the Basilica of the Wiersenheiligen, which means 14 saints, what the holy helpers are referred to in Bavaria. A boy named Hermann Leicht appropriately a shepherd boy, saw a crying child in a field one day. When he bent down to pick it up, it disappeared. The child reappeared a short time later, this time with two burning candles next to it. In June of 1446, Herman saw the child a third time. There was a red cross on his chest and 13 other children with him. The child turned to Herman and said, We are the 14 helpers and wish to erect a chapel here where we can rest. If you will be our servant, we will be yours. Miraculous healings were soon witnessed in the area, all attributed to the 14 saints, of which St. Margaret was one. The Cistercian monks who owned the land where the appearances occurred erected a chapel. The Basilica of the Virzen Heiligen was built around it in the late 1700s. Devotion to the Holy Helpers spread in the 15th century although they were never officially recognized by the Catholic Church, and their feast day of the 8th of August never made it onto the general Roman calendar. Today, the Holy Helper's cult is most developed in Bavaria and in Central and Eastern Europe. Margaret is also one of the saints that spoke to Joan of Arc, a warrior saint we'll learn more about in a future episode. It's at Margaret's urging and the urging of St. Catherine of Alexandria and Michael the Archangel in a divine vision that Joan disguised herself as a man like St. Marina and took up arms to support Charles VII to reclaim France from England in the Hundred Years' War. St. Margaret of Antioch's attributes are a slain dragon and a demon and a hammer. In Eastern Orthodox art, Margaret is shown beating the devil with this hammer. In Western European art, the dragon is usually present. As mentioned, medieval artists tended to show the moment she burst forth from the dragon's belly. Later artworks from the Renaissance onwards are more symbolic. St. Margaret stands on the dragon, her foot on its head as its conqueror, or else she leads the beast on a chain like a leashed pet dog. After the Reformation, when the Catholic Church clamped down on art that was deemed too fantastic or too sexual, Margaret was depicted as a shepherdess, or in the moment of her beheading. Margaret's feast day in the East is the 13th of July, 
In the West, it's on the 20th of the same month, the same time that the ancient Greeks celebrated Aphrodisia, the festival of Aphrodite. St. Margaret's relics are spread all over Western Europe. Bones and body parts of St. Marina are centered in the East, mainly in Greece and Cyprus. Her body, dressed in the simple habit of a monk, is in Lebanon. The St. Marina Coptic Church in Cairo also claims to have possession of her body. Although not recognized by the Roman Catholic Church, St. Margaret of Antioch's popularity has never waned. The inclusion of a dragon makes her a firm favorite with artists since the medieval era. And her story about a woman who defied a man giving her two choices, becoming his wife or his concubine, has found resonance with modern Christian women and non-believers alike. Before we finish, one more note about St. Margaret's name. I mentioned earlier that the root word giving us the name Margaret means pearl. It also means a bouquet of flowers, particularly those that are small and pearl-like. This definition gives the cocktail margarita its meaning, little daisy. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of St. Podcast, St. Margaret, the Vanquisher of Dragons. Special thanks to Sue Berent, who provided readings from the Golden Legend and the Bible, and was the voice of St. Margaret. Also, big thanks to Amy Vanacor, who composed the piano interludes in this episode. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to St. Podcast and leave a review. Feel free to follow our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts for updates and images of the artworks and topics covered. The next episode in St. Podcast series on martyrs is about another virgin saint. In her guise as the male god Shango, she's the most feared deity in Santeria. Also, her legend is one of the inspirations for the fairy tale Rapunzel. Tune in next time for the story of St. Barbara.